Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Myron May? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Myron May was born in Dayton, Ohio, in 1983. His father served in the Navy and reportedly struggled with cocaine use. Myron lived with his mother growing up. At some point, his mother was no longer able to care for him. It appears as though he was in foster care for a while until moving to Florida to live with his maternal grandmother at the age of 12. Myron attended high school and was active in basketball and track. After graduating, he enrolled at Florida State University. He had a run-in with campus police in 2002. They thought he was using marijuana, but he was never charged. In 2005, Myron graduated with honors with a degree in economics. He attended Texas Tech University School of Law and graduated in 2009. He received a license to practice law in both Texas and New Mexico. After this, he had a series of job changes. He found a job in Houston making about $160,000 a year, but he quit less than two years later. He found a job representing employers in labor disputes. He quit that job six months later. In June of 2012, he found a job at a smaller firm making less money. In May of 2013, he left that job saying he was going to start a business in Denver, Colorado, but there is no indication he ever did that. Not long after this, Myron was hired as a public defender in New Mexico making about $50,000 a year. In January of 2014, he quit that job and was hired as a prosecutor in New Mexico. Sometime in 2013, Myron started dating a pediatrician named Danielle Nixon. In March of 2014, Danielle noticed that Myron's behavior was changing. Here are a few examples of what she noticed over the next several months. He stopped going to church. He claimed to have intense back pain, but there was no apparent cause. Myron was becoming fidgety and had trouble sitting. He was always trying to move his back. He became convinced that he had ADHD, and he had two panic attacks. As time progressed, Myron became paranoid as well. He slept wearing all of his clothes and with a knife because he did not trust his neighbors. When he was driving, he thought he was being followed. When someone pulled out in front of him, that confirmed his suspicions, like he believed that was a sign he was definitely being followed. And he would not talk in his car because he believed it contained recording devices. Danielle ended her relationship with Myron after about 15 months. Myron went to a police station on September 7, 2014. He told them that he was hearing voices and being watched through a camera in his house. Specifically, he said that he was climbing out of a bubble bath and heard voices say, did you see that? He never puts lotion on. Myron believed the people talking were evil conspirators, but it seems strange that they would be so concerned with his skincare regimen. Maybe that was the long-term plan of the conspirators. They were not going to try to harm Myron in some expedient manner, but rather facilitate a slow destruction through poor lotion management. Like the head of their secret organization was an evil dermatologist or something. On September 25, Myron checked into a mental health treatment facility. Four days after this, he was released. On October 6, Myron resigned from the district attorney's office without offering any explanation. The next day, he confronted Danielle at her residence. He handed her a piece of his SUV, which he said was a camera that had been installed by the police. Danielle called the police, but they were unable to locate Myron, which appears to disprove Myron's whole theory. Myron had traveled to Florida and stayed with a family friend. He returned to Florida State University, not as a student, but rather just as a guy who walked around campus. One day he even sat in a class and had a bizarre conversation with other students. On November 14, Myron posted a message on a Facebook page for targeted individuals, which read, quote, Has anyone ever been encouraged by your handler to kill with the promise of freedom? Unquote. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On November 20, 2014, 
Myron went to the campus library just before 12.30 a.m. He was quite familiar with the library from his time in college. He walked into the front lobby and shot at five people with a semi-automatic pistol chambered in 380. Three people were struck. Myron never progressed past the front lobby. He exited the building and was confronted by the police, who ordered him to drop the gun. He said, why don't you shoot me already? It appears the police were asking themselves the same question. They proceeded to shoot him 24 times. Myron May did not survive. He was 31 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. This case involves something referred to as gang stalking, which is also referred to as being a targeted individual. As I mentioned, Myron was on a Facebook page for targeted individuals. He believed that's what was happening. Gang stalking is when a person believes that a group of three or more people have organized to stalk, harass, or threaten them. It is assumed that the vast majority of the time when someone reports that they are a targeted individual, the belief is inaccurate, meaning they have the subjective experience of being harassed by multiple people, but in reality, no such harassment is occurring. Individual stalking is quite different than gang stalking. Here are some key differences. Individual stalking is relatively common. Gang stalking is not. Individual stalking typically has a shorter duration. It features a wide variety of communication methods, including text messages, emails, and letters. These are not present in most of the gang stalking reports. Victims of individual stalking almost always know who the perpetrator is. Those reporting gang stalking typically cannot identify the perpetrators because the perpetrators don't exist. The vast majority of individual stalking reports are real. Almost all gang stalking reports involve delusions. Item number two, Myron May believed that he was a targeted individual, but was that the case? Let's compare what we know from the research about gang stalking with Myron's experiences. 80% of targeted individuals believe that multiple agencies are involved in the conspiracy. Myron believed this was true, and he believed his co-workers and family members conspired against him as well. 60% of targeted individuals believe their home is being monitored for audio or video. Myron believed that his house was bugged and a camera was installed in his vehicle. 90% of targeted individuals believe that they are being followed. Myron believed he was being followed by cars on the road. He believed that he was being followed in Walmart and his co-workers were peeking around corners looking at him while he was at work. 40% of targeted individuals believe that the government is controlling their mind. Myron had a few things to say about this. He claimed he was being hit by a directed energy weapon which could control people's thoughts and cause pain, which sounds a lot like the descriptions given by people affected by Havana syndrome. I have a separate video on that topic. Myron thought that the weapons were physically cooking him in his chair the conspirators were trying to convince him that he was guilty of a crime by harassing him electronically. His conversations with co-workers convinced him that they were trying to cheat him out of money in order to make him more vulnerable to harassment. Noises from the homes of neighbors were part of a noise campaign designed to destroy him mentally. I was thinking maybe his neighbors were like Miley Cyrus or Hilary Duff, but I think Myron was talking more about a non-singing noise campaign. 30% of targeted individuals believe the police are in on the conspiracy. This is probably why he chose to have his final confrontation with the police. When considering the similarities between targeted individuals in the research literature and Myron's experiences, it seems clear he was suffering from the gang-stalking delusion. It's possible his psychosis was caused by schizophrenia. Item number three, why do some people who develop schizophrenia have delusions that appear to fit in distinct categories. We see that all delusions tend to fall in a number of categories like grandiose, paranoid, erotomanic, persecutory, jealous, and somatic. Why aren't delusional beliefs more random? In the case of a targeted individual, their delusions seem to be a combination of paranoid and persecutory. It's not exactly clear why delusions often fit the categories or why some people develop the gang-stalking delusion in particular. One possibility is that because the paranoia comes first, 
an individual who is becoming delusional seeks out information related to covert surveillance, government agencies, and mind control. Just like when somebody has anxiety, they tend to find reasons to justify feeling anxious, like they tend to look for anxiety-provoking stimuli. Perhaps people who are paranoid start to look for information that justifies the paranoia. They believe in the paranoid delusions. Therefore, they have to shape the world into a frightening place where being paranoid makes sense. This restores them to a position where they don't consider themselves mentally ill. All of these delusional categories are represented online. So if somebody who is paranoid finds posts about targeted individuals, the material is really going to resonate with them. The more research they do on it, the more convinced they become that they have found the answer. Like a vine growing on a wooden lattice, the delusions take the shape of the targeted individual narrative. Item number four, most people who believe they are targeted individuals never become violent. Why did Myron May turn to violence? I think the psychosis turned Myron's strengths against him. For example, Myron was confident, believed in law and order, intelligent, and brave. His confidence meant that he was going to believe the delusional thought processes. He would not have doubted that the voices were real. He believed in his ability to perceive accurately. The commitment to law and order meant that he was someone who is more than capable and willing to fight back against something that he felt was wrong. He was going to take action against the conspiracy. He was going to try to fix the situation, not only for himself, but for everybody, all the people who were targeted individuals. His intelligence helped him to form a plan to fight the conspiracy, and his bravery permitted him to go through with a very dangerous act, one that was ultimately lethal for him. In this way, we see the cruelty of psychosis. It converted the positive features of Myron into a force of destruction. Item number five. Myron was treated by an individual therapist and in a mental health facility, yet no one realized how dangerous he was. There are a few possible reasons this happened. Schizophrenia does not develop all at once, if that is in fact what Myron had. During the onset, Myron probably had good days and bad days, good weeks and bad weeks. He may have seen the mental health professionals during times when he was less symptomatic. Myron was intelligent and paranoid. He would have avoided revealing the nature of his fears to clinicians. They probably never realized he was psychotic or thought that the psychosis would not return. Most people who say bizarre things are not experiencing hallucinations or delusions. For example, they could be politicians instead. Item number six, even if Myron fully believed in the delusions, didn't he know right from wrong? Myron clearly knew the difference between right and wrong. For example, in his writings, he asked for forgiveness and wanted those he harmed to have a spirit of contentment and peace. Certainly, Myron knew that there was another way to bring attention to the conspiracy other than hurting people. I think Myron was probably frustrated and in a lot of pain. He was fighting an invisible enemy. He was desperate to expose the perceived treachery. This was probably a case where he simply could not stand the suffering anymore. In his last moments, he was not acting rationally. He felt as though he needed to bring everything to a stop, regardless of the method. Maybe he believed that simply holding a weapon would not persuade the police to fire on him. If they were watching him and could read his mind like he believed, it makes sense they wouldn't be deceived by him simply holding the gun. Myron may have felt like he needed to shoot somebody in order to convince the police that he meant business. Now moving to my final thoughts. In the rare instances when somebody with schizophrenia commits a terrible crime, it's easy to forget who they once were. Myron was a highly respected attorney. He was intelligent, had a great sense of humor. He was described as an upstanding citizen who wanted to help people. I don't think that Myron wanted to be a criminal. I don't think he wanted to hurt anybody. Myron's perceptions were affected by psychosis, such that he felt the need to fight back. Delusions made him defensive. A part of him knew he was wrong, but he did not know what else to do. He could not resist the delusional message. Myron's victims, as well as Myron himself, deserve compassion and understanding. Myron said that he did not want to die in vain. He probably thought his actions would expose a vast conspiracy, 
In reality, they raised awareness about mental illness. So perhaps some good came of this terrible situation. Those are my thoughts on the case of Myron May. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.